Welcome to Early Matters, the podcast on the science and policy of early childhood, hosted by Dr. Catherine B. Stevens. Early Matters features in-depth conversations with leading researchers, practitioners, and policy experts on what matters most for young children and their families to thrive. Welcome to another episode of Early Matters, the Center on Child and Family Policy's new podcast. I'm Katherine Stevens, your host and the founder and CEO of the Center on Child and Family Policy. I'm delighted today to welcome Chris Bullivant, who leads the Social Capital Campaign, founded in 2021 to promote social capital and the institutions that create it. He's done a lot of interesting things prior to this work, including helping launch Unheard, a British news and opinion website founded in July 2017, and leading the Center for Social Justice, which is a London-based think tank promoting government policies that tackle the root causes of poverty. Today, we're talking about his current work leading the Social Capital Campaign, and in particular, the campaign's most recent publication, The Early Years, which is focused on the foundational importance of the birth to three period, and especially the importance of secure attachment developed in those first three years, which the report argues forms the basic building block of social capital. I'm really excited to learn more about all of this from Chris. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Catherine. It's great to be with you. So um, I guess to start with, if you could just give us a, as I said, I, I'm eager to, to to talk more about this report focusing on my area, which is early childhood. Um, but before we get to that, could you give us just an overview of the social capital campaign, how it got started, what it's trying to do, and probably a question you get a lot, which is, what is social capital? Yeah, of course, that'd be great. I think, uh, yeah, we set up the social capital campaign, I think, a little bit concerned after, you know, with the COVID years around polarization in the United States, um, seemingly lots of people living together unharmoniously, um, as we saw in sort of rioting across America, um, and then those sad events on the Capitol Hill. And, um, and so we thought, well, this breakdown in trust across society stems probably from a, this collapse of social capital. And say, so what is social capital? What is this weird elastic term and what does it mean? Well, we think of it as the um, description of the rich network of relationships between individuals. Um, some people might talk about it as everything that exists outside of the relationship between the individual and the state. Um, but we're talking about families, friends, neighborhoods, and nonprofits and faith groups, that sort of thing. So, one definition or kind of, I guess, description of social capital that I um, that I've read is associational network. Is that right? Is that can you say? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I think, yeah, and I think, um, which I think comes to mean just voluntarily entered into relationships. Is that right? Whether that's sort of through an informal association, such as a, a I know. Some, some meetups with with neighbors or th- through to something more formal in its structure such as a, a non-profit and i think associational life is there to to, to cover um or associational networks is to, there to to cover that entire sort of spectrum of different activity is that is, is that what you would I, th- think? I think so so can you just give some concrete examples of social capital like how would you know it if you saw it yeah well we talk about three types of social capital one, those sort of very um, intimate, uh, nurturing, caring relationships in childhood. We sort of had put that as number one. And then number two, all of the relationships that sustain um, an adult throughout the life course uh, in a personal and then a professional sort of context. Um, and so that, I mean, that really can be anything other, other, if you think of yourself and the IRS or yourself and the DMV, if you ignore those relationships, it's pretty much everything else, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so th- that's sort of what we are talking about. Um, and we, we, and then the third type of social capital we talk about is the byproduct of those first two, the sort of slightly mysterious, social capital that exists between the imagined community that is the United States of America. Um, We have found that trust that's generated in those uh, rich networks of relationships in childhood and adulthood are the things that allow for a greater, more robust sense of trust um, in the people you've never met. 
Um, so that's that's sort of the three types of social capital that we're talking about in the social capital campaign. So what is what are some concrete examples of how social capital functions? Yeah. Like if I have it, um, what? How does that make my life better? What do I do with it? Um, and the flip side of that, if I don't have it, then what happens to me? Yeah. Well, I think I mean these are great questions because I think we we we're talking about. Um, uh, yeah, a whole myriad, a whole network of different relationships that essentially are the very thing that give gives life meaning um, and enjoyment. It's kind of like why we are here. So we aren't here just to sort of, I mean, voting is exciting, but we aren't here just to vote. We aren't here just to receive a welfare program. You know, we are here on this planet to enjoy relationships. So that is with family, that is with friends, that's with community. Um, and then that's with colleagues and work. Um, but the idea of associations, people coming together in order to sort of do something, um, whether that is enjoyment uh, at a winery or whether that is, you know, to set up some sort of for-profit business with, with all of the, the benefits that entailed there. And similarly, you know, it's faith groups, attendance at church and a church community, um, or any sort of like volunteering or nonprofits kind of activity. But it's all, it's a range, a spectrum of different relationships, all of which are um, private um, in as much as they aren't something that's owned by the government or they're not owned by a corporation. Right. So sort of not the government, not business, just sort of people and the rest of their lives, essentially. Yeah. And, and so, so lots, if, you, yeah. if you don't have it, like what, then what? What, yeah. what? what are some examples of what happens if you don't have social? How does that manifest itself? Yeah. So I think we, we've talked about a like four quadrants. So we, we um, talk about well, four types of situations you can have. You can have people with low social capital and also low capital. You can have people with high capital, but low capital. Similarly, the bonus situation is if you're a, you've got high social capital and high capital, and then um, and then that, that there's a mysterious fourth, which is you know people with tons of money but no social capital. I'm not quite sure who they are, but I think the um, what we have seen a study show that people with greater amounts of social capital, uh, relationships, and networks um, are are happier in general. So if you have a, a healthy, strong, stable uh, family, then you, and you are more likely to participate in other social capital creating activities such as faith attendance or volunteering in your community. Um, all of these things have impact on your mental health, your physical health, and your longevity by and large. Um, they make you uh, happier and wealthier people. Um, and then you are able to pass on not just your financial wealth, but you're generating social capital that is able to be passed on to others. Those who have less social capital, so for example, um, they're, they're, the family they grew up in wasn't as stable, wasn't as extended, wasn't as rich in, in, the, in the network of relationships, find themselves at greater risk of educational failure or um, mental health sort of issues, or um, just find it harder perhaps to get out of poverty. The sort of resilience and relational resources that are needed for upward social mobility require lots of social capital um, in order to be able to do it. And if you're looking around in a desert of social capital, your neighborhood sort of lacks it. There's high indicators of a lack of social capital, such as crime. Um, then it's, it's harder to figure out what do good positive relationships look like. And um, and then with that, the wherewithal to be able to sort of like um, grow in life. So it sounds as though one way of kind of a, I don't know, sort of a layman's way of putting this would be social capital or is kind of the network of people in your own life, people you have relationships with, people you can call on, people you can depend on, people you can hang out with people, which requires trust. So these are got to be people, if you're going to call on someone when you need help, whether it's taking your cat to the vet or giving you a loan because you just lost your job, right? You, you only call on people or depend on people in that way if you trust them. And I guess we do hang out with people that we don't trust, but we don't really love doing it that much, right? We prefer to hang out with people that we we trust. So it sounds like that's kind of what you, what this kind of means. Is is that does that sound right? Yeah, I think that is totally exactly right. That's that is that is exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then what? So okay, so that's that makes sense because that is you've said is exactly 
the kind of the glue, well, it's like the glue that holds our life together. It's also what gives our life meaning. Um, so what is the social capital campaign doing to promote that thing? Yeah, so I think the reason that we're using this um, strange term of social capital to describe something so, so normal um, to, to life is that we have um, been heavily influenced by Senator Mike Lee's framework that he developed on the Joint Economic Committee um, and the amazing work that they have done there on the social capital project. Um, when the senator was chair of the Joint Economic Committee, he, with Dr. Scott Winship on his staff at the time, developed this framework, the Social Capital Project, as a way of being able to talk about these sorts of issues or r- relationships, these sort of like basic um, matters of life in economic terms. Um, in order to be able to talk to, to policymakers about the uh, impact on the economy that these sorts of networks of relationship have. Um, so that's why we're using that term. Um, and we've just wanted to be able to, to to package that up to create a sort of off-the-shelf policy platform um, for any incoming presidential nominee. Just we're, we're putting this together as a resource. What What might these... Um, sorts of issues look like around family and education, you know, getting a job, being in your community, what sort of federal policies either help um, people build those relationships or actually are hindering people building those relationships. The social capital campaigns in this strange spot of trying to talk about something that exists outside of government's control and we're talking to the government about right. about it right. coming up with federal policies for something they can't do i mean government cannot create social capital um, but federal government needs social capital if it's to be able to govern you can't govern 330 million people if there isn't trust between everyone so when you see this like collapsing of, of trust in federal government the collapse of trust in the executive a collapse in trust um, in media and a collapse in trust and experts, then people become increasingly ungovernable. So what you have to do is to be massively mindful about the, your footprint on the social capital creation in America, and you need to be able to rebuild it. There are strong stocks of trust at the local level. People trust their local government. They trust their local media. They trust people they can see, I think, <laughs> buildings right. that they can drive past. Um, but I think once it becomes remote, it's, uh, it becomes a little bit harder. So I think we're wanting to create a sort of platform of policies that other other um, essentially conservatives think seem to be right on um, that someone can pick up and say, OK, this is something that we can do to rebuild. I mean, the thing is, people just want to be able to get educated have a job, start a family, and have a, a nice neighborhood, a nice community they can be a part of and invest in. And so it's not at all controversial, but getting there, you know, seems to be a little bit tricky, especially for those neighborhoods that have long-term dysfunction or intergenerational transmission of poverty. And so that's some of what we're trying to do is coming up with policies that someone could could execute to uh, help build social capital. So the previous podcast mm. I recorded was with uh, Professor Heckman and his colleague, Jorge Garcia. One of the parts of the discussion was on defining deprivation in early childhood. So I want, I'm about to want to switch to that, but just mm. sort of on any, at any age level, one of the things that they said that was so interesting is that we, we were strongly inclined to define poverty, deprivation in early childhood in financial terms. However, they argue that um, it is actually the quality of early relationships that matter the most. And I, as I said, I want to I want to switch to the to that focus, uh, the early years focus in a minute. But it sounds as though it's really kind of a, a lens that that is worth take, worth um, amplifying in general, right? That the focus that we've had on sort of deprivation in people's lives, we focus on money, but it sounds like what you're saying is that money obviously is essential to having certain kinds of things that you've just described, uh, but money alone is not going to be sufficient for people to be happy in their lives. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think when when we started out the campaign, we um, 
got a whole bunch of people together in a room just to sort of thrash through what what do you think the challenges are that that when you're thinking about your policy subject expertise what are the challenges that you're you're trying to address um it was actually quite difficult to get people to do that because people are so used to sort of fusing their analysis of what's going on with the policy solution. It's sort of like a sort of a reflex. And so, but we were trying to, to back up. And one of the things that struck me as being quite important to do was to figure out who is it that we're talking about when we're talking about policy type solutions? Because a you know relatively well to do middle class family that have you know that have got um They've got family, they've got in-laws, they've got extended family, they perhaps go to a church or some other house of worship. They they've got good uh, professional networks from college and then kind of like their their work. You know that, that when we're talking about I don't know, something like paid family leave or or something like that, that is a totally different sort of conversation when we're talking about the distribution of like money. These are people who have social capital anyway, so actually the kind of a welfare program or a voluntary program that's providing some financial respite for during uh, a maternity break um, or family leave break that's a very different sort of situation to sort of like doling out money to someone who um, has never known a dad has never seen any uh, anything other than abusive relationships or physical intimidation who sort of like you know is hearing kind of like crime left right and center and literally has never seen anybody in a job so um just sort of doesn't know how, where, where to start and um so in that sort of a situation where someone has low social capital so there, there's a lack of there's a desert of relationships there's a desert of people having role model to them boundaries metacognition goal setting and emotional regulation they're handing out money is going to be great in terms of like making sure that they've got somewhere to to live and some food but that's that's all it is going to do and so what what we're talking about is there must be a package of of um solutions around that whereby relationship is also prioritized um i think my concern for example around universal basic income type considerations is like well that's great but you can just like park people on money you have to be able to like show uh, show relationships, and that's where I think there's a limitation in what you can do through the state. I mean, social services can perhaps provide some help, um, but the role of the voluntary sector is like totally massive in this situation because it's the voluntary provision of care that is the very demonstration of, of relationship that people are needing to see like before their very eyes. So if that's a church group, you know, bussing out, or even if it's just something small, like, um, uh, you know, providing a summer camp for kids, just sometimes like a one week respite from the chaotic situation can be enough to shine a light of like, this is what good quality relationships look like. And just one small glimpse of that can actually provide the navigation for someone to, you know, to sort of like find safety later on in life. Yes, exactly. So, um, so, all right. So, this, this, these kinds of issues are, are um, the sorts of issues that we talk about. In the obviously coming at it usually from a different angle, but in the policy world, um, it's unusual to be focusing on early childhood in this context. Um, so, you just uh, you just um, put out a, a report um, on the earliest years. Um, so I, so I, I'm curious to hear more about what you, what, what the core point of this report is or what you learned in putting it together and in particular, um, attachment theory, what that is and how that's figuring into what we've been, we've been talking about. Yeah. Well, and this is why I'm really keen to be able to hear, hear more from your listeners too about this. But I think my interest in, in um, early years and attachment was sort of started when I was working at the Centre for Social Justice in London. And we were coming up with, uh, as you mentioned, um, policies to address poverty in the UK that were more than just about redistribution of wealth. Um, and what became really clear is, is that the naught to three period is very critical for being able to establish um, a really solid foundation in someone's sort of identity. And then at the same time, um, needing to uh, 
that, that creates that sort of a bit of a calls to arm about investing earlier on. A lot of what we were c- coming across in every single government department was a government department had a mission. It would then, because of budgetary constraints, end up just dealing with the crisis or the emergency. That was usually once someone was an adult. Um, and then so whether that's incarceration, you know, the criminal justice system, whether it's policing, whether it's welfare, whether it's um, foster care, it's always dealing with the crisis at the end. Um, so it's, it's once the car has impacted another car. And so none of it is like walking down the street and putting a traffic light in to start, you know, to stop, stop the accident in the first place. And so, and this will be very similar, I'm sure, to what you were talking about in your previous podcast. So I think there's a, it's a combination of if you're able to make sure that public hands, you know, voluntary money is like leveraged toward that naught to threes, you, you are, you are saving yourself a huge amount of, um, time and money later on when it comes to the, the you know, the public purse. And then also, do you have that phrase here? The public purse <laughs> it sounds like someone running around in, in tights and a, and a ruff around their neck. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, federal money. Federal and, um, money. There you go. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's it's really important. I so that was important, obviously, in the UK. Coming here, and I I returned um, back to the US th- three or so years ago um, with with our my wife and I's American daughter, and it's very interesting to see the situation here being so different. There are such strengths, obviously, to the American economy, the American economy c- compared to something in Western Europe, and such distinctives um, that have helped to create, you know, American exceptionalism. And yet it's also very strange that one in four women return to work just two weeks after giving birth. I mean, it's, it's actually an unimaginable thing to, for, for, for me as a European to get my head around um, because it, it is so bizarre. But um, I mean, we are just, whether it's, whether you want to take it as a as evolution or faith or whatever, you, whatever tradition you want to like hold to, the science is actually that we are wired as mammals, to have a secure attachment to our mother, our biological mother, once we have been born, as we were in utero, um, it is totally essential for our brain development, um, as well as our sort of psychosocial development. I'm totally speaking as a lay person, I put my hands up to that, I'm not an expert on this, but I've just had had a sort of relatively long-term engagement around these policy questions and the impact of early years on them. So yeah, it is important. I, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. So attachment theory is, can you just summarize again, what is attachment theory? Just to clarify, I think when we talk about investment in the early years, this this country, um, I think Western countries, maybe across the the globe, were very focused on the idea of the education system as building, quote, human capital, right? Which I think social capital is kind of, I don't know, but I'm imagining sort of part of that. But we're so focused on the education system. So one of the things that I've argued is that now, you know, now that we are recognizing science is, is helping us understand how very important these early years are, because we're so used to thinking about school as the way we develop humans, now that we're understanding how important the early years are, we're thinking that means early school. And so investment is often discussed in terms of investing in early education, the way we invest in say fourth grade. Um, so in terms of the focus of the early years report and the, the focus on the attachment theory, what's different about that mm. in terms of thinking about investment in the, in the first three years? Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Because yeah, what we're talking about is probably the complete opposite of, of that approach. So uh, attachment theory was developed by um, British psychologist uh, John Bowlby in the mid 20th century, who was an individual who was grew up with a nanny and was an evacuee child. Um, and he was sort of traumatized when his nanny left. And I think that was sort of the foundation for his sort of own interest in the subject. Um, and then was further developed here in the US by Mary Ainsworth, who ended up here in Charlottesville, where I am based at the moment. But I think attachment theory is the idea that, you know, as as mammals, you know, we have a 
a, a biological imperative to be able to attach to our mother, that our very identity is formed um, th through that attachment, through that secure attachment. That is developed through um, uh, available, predictable, attuned quality care from your uh mother um uh, there's uh, evidence around that being important um uh, around the mother's voice and pheromones and you know all, all of it there is there is a distinctive about the biological mother that is that is important in that process when a when a human baby is born um it, it's brain is significantly underdeveloped it would not be possible to exit the birth canal if we had a fully developed brain and so these first three years are where the human brain are developed um i you know there's a, a huge number of synaptic connections being made every second in those first three years um and then because we are relational beings those that has to take place in the context of a relationship and that's a lot to do with um my understanding is that's a lot to do with uh, the hormonal um responses so that uh when a baby finds itself in distress there's like th th there is cortisol that is flowing through the body and then oxytocin the bonding hormone um is, is what helps that child regulate it, it, it's him or herself to then um sort of be less stressed out. And again, that sort of bonding is like really important. Eye to eye contact, physical touch, all of those sorts of things are like really important in that process. But when a when a baby is born, it has no idea that it has been born at first. And then it has no idea that it is separate from its mother. And it takes a while um, for that child to be able to individuate um, to be, uh, to realize it is separate from its mother, um, and that whole process like t takes some months, um, and takes the physical availability of the mother to be able to do it. Um, there's obviously lots of situations where that can't take place. A mother who dies in childbirth. So, um, so we, we have managed to survive centuries with with sort of attachment being disrupted. But the the, the gold standard and the norm is, is for that to be able to take place. And then what we want to be able to see there is this, the child developing a secure base in that relationship with with, with the mother, um, supported by um, the biological father, and then um, if we're talking in general terms around the mass the, the mass population then um they are the secure base and the child is able to explore um away from that base because they so they have a secure attachment they feel safer to be able to explore whether that is play um to, to be able to investigate other things and then they are able to go back to that secure base and so those those patterns of relationships around attachment are, are formed in those first three years, um, and then I think there's there's an array of of uh, different forms of attachment if that is not secure attachment, avoidant, and, and, and the other the other ones. But those relationship patterns and the sense of trust and the quality of relationships that you have are set in those first three years in that sort of primary attachment. Yeah, and so from the report you wrote, secure attachment is a significant factor for positive mental health, educational attainment, empathy development, and the ability to enter into caring, loving relationships. And so in terms of how these first three years and this development of a secure attachment is fitting in to this bigger social capital picture, I guess that's that's you're sort of arguing that it's the very found it's sort of forming yeah, the foundation huge. that enables us to conduct our our relationships and the rest of life. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, we are we are seeing it as like really big because you this is it's totally foundational. The attachment and if you know being able to have secure attachment is the very thing that establishes how you view the world and yourself, um, and your your place in the world and how you view other relationships. Your um, people with secure attachment are, are evidence shows less likely to enter into risky behavior in adolescence and adulthood as it relates to alcohol or promiscuity or you know or that sort of thing those things that you know might be fun but sort of actually end up sort of being sort of detrimental across the life course um they also like really determine the quality of trust that people have with other people so if we're seeing a societal wide collapse in trust it would seem that it would be really 
sensible to invest in the early years to make sure that from a very foundational level, the lens with which people are able to look out on the world is one that is trusting. Um, and it's also, though, it's not naive. People with secure attachment are usually or typically much more resistant to bullying, um, much more uh able to be robust and and have a greater sense of who other people are and whether to sort of trust them or not and less rocked around by it all and what i think what i found really interesting researching for that paper was a really clear correlation at least between um a rise in presumably um uh, non-maternal care, perhaps through daycare centres in the last couple of decades um, with more women uh, being able to take up opportunities in the workplace. Um, and then also the rise of uh, youth mental health crisis. So one really interesting um, set of stats is around uh, first years at UCLA, um, a study that has been sort of done, done with those. And you see increasingly a total inability to cope with the stress of becoming a freshman at college. Um, and what is it that determines our sense or ability to be able to cope with stress? It's our cortisol levels and our relationship to stress and stress management um, established in the early years. Similarly, people with less secure attachment or insecure attachment are much more likely to find themselves in addictive behavior um, or addictive type um, patterning. And so I think that's what possibly could explain a rise in, um, in polysubstance abuse. Um, what we are seeing definitely, for sure, is a rise in depressive and anxiety-related episodes. Um, and anxiety, such as separation anxiety when you're a little one, um, all of that stuff is like set at a very foundational level in your zero to threes. So the focus of the social capital campaign is primarily on federal policy, what are some of the general kinds of policy ideas you guys are thinking about might kind of help uh, support the development of this kind of secure attachment that is so f- uh, fundamental to really the, yeah. the, the well-being of our whole society? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that is really clear is that the, the United States is probably the least um, hospitable environment for uh, allowing secure attachment to take place. Um, A lack of financial stability, especially for people on lower incomes. But uh, actually, to be honest, I mean, conceiving a child and then thinking about bringing it into this uh, world can, can for too many, I think, just be a financially catastrophic event in the United States, um, which may or may not explain why 75% of abortions take place amongst those who are on low income or poor. Um, Because people don't necessarily have the uh, health insurance that they might need for for, birth or complications. They certainly can't take a drop in income that that having a child would take place. So I think that's why often in other advanced economies, you do have a basic paid family leave uh, policy in place so that actually having a child isn't going to kill you um, you can actually have that without economic disruption most people generally have their children earlier on in their lives when they're on their lower sort of income on their earning scale um, and so also they may need it for that reason um, so i think there's that there's the healthcare system is, is an issue so I think when we're talking about federal policy, I think it could be looking at sort of creative ways to make sure that the, having having a child is less catastrophic. One of the areas that sort of concerns me on this is the um, are, are one in three children are Hispanic in the United States. Um, and Hispanic families typically have quite high levels of social capital, even if they're overrepresented in poverty statistics. But they have a strong belief in family and extended family, typically the part of a faith community. So there, there are lots of other, uh, and they will say you will have a higher number of people who are in work than their white counterparts. Um, there, and they have a much higher belief in the American dream compared to their uh, white or other counterparts. But what's a concern to me there is that so they, they're, they may be low income, but there is high levels of social capital. There might be a grandmother around and th- that sort of thing to help out with sort of parenting. But what is a concern is that, uh, to, is that, that here there's quite a decline in church attendance amongst Hispanics and there is a decline in um, in in marriage rates. I think there's an increase in cohabiting. And um and then the, if people are holding down three jobs 
um, to sort of make ends meet, you're seeing this like gutting within the family um, with children perhaps either being neglected um, just to be able to make ends meet. So what possibly we might be seeing there is a sort of potential decline of social capital amongst people who are low income, which could then lead to, if, if they're not seeing positive relationships role modeled, if they're not sort of having investment in early years, if there's not secure attachment, if there's like long-term um uh, disengagement of parents through through child because they're just having to make ends meet, then this could be a problem because it could be creating those low social capital, low capital um, groups of the future or of the very near future. So I think when we're looking at federal policy, it's definitely wanting to be able to reward work, reward um, you know positive pro social like uh, f- family situations, but it's wanting to make sure that doesn't come at the cost of it, people's and you know social capital b- building. So I think it's important not to sort of whisk the mother off to work two weeks after giving birth, um, but make sure that there is time for there to be secure attachment built. Because investing three years, if we if, if we're all sort of going to be living till we're a hundred, or a third of us are going to be living till we're a hundred years old then three years investment out of 100 is a very small you know, amount of time to be able to invest in someone. And for those people who want you know, massive GDP, you will have a greater GDP if you have reliable, safe, secure, attached um, individuals who are able to save, able to grow themselves economically than if you've just got a huge cohort of people on UBI who don't know how to relate to each other, who are kind of like, um, you know, on pre- prescribed medication, you know, just unable to sort of like move on in life. So I think this is sort of ca- ca- catastrophic type style picture. But I think the importance here around federal policy would be to make sure that people's um, is to support people's aspirations. Most people want to be able to have a family. Most people want to do some form of stay-at-home parenting um, and then wanting to make sure that people's social capital is built, not destroyed. And another thing that you emphasized in the report that I found really interesting um, and you've talked about elsewhere is the increasing isolation of parents, um, whether or not they're they're married, um, I've had conversations with um, people who work with a nurse family um, partnership uh, who who are who deal with young women um, who've just had a baby. This is this is I was having a conversation with someone recently about this. A, wom- a young woman who's twenty one or twenty two and has just had a baby. And there is literally no one in her life she can depend on. So whether she herself had good, had a, had a secure attachment, whether she had um, someone in her life early on, um, obviously if she had, that would help a great deal. Uh, but even if she had, um, literally someone in their apartment all by themselves with this tiny little baby and no one, um, no one to call on, which is just kind of unimaginable um so that's like a very extreme example and then yeah, well i don't even- know if it is that extreme i mean i think when we're talking uh, so yeah we we talk about um uh you know the village it takes the village to raise a child and and, and it, um i'm not quite sure what hillary clinton's intention was in, in writing that but i think what it seems to have come to to, to mean and this goes to your point earlier about the education system is that people think it takes you know a, a village literally raises the child but actually what what is needed is a village is needed to support the parent in the raising of their child. And it's that village around the parents that is definitely in demise. I mean, this is what is so sad. I mean, honestly, some of the stuff that I've been coming across in the research for this social capital campaign is so depressing. It's actually really quite bleak that whether it's um, the number of people who are in their uh, older years who live by themselves, whether it is um, people who are prime working age who just do not have friends. I mean, the number of, of people who have... Uh, you know, more than three friends they can count on is like completely like diminished over the last 20, 30 years. Um, People increasingly only find relationships, uh, whether that's, you know, platonic friendships or whether that's, you know, marriage partners in the work context. Um, I'm sure work from home has been a disaster for that, if that's the case. But um, 
so I think the village, uh, p- people do not hang out with their neighbours as, as much as they used to um, in the 70s or 80s. So I think there's, there is a decline in the village around. And then with, obviously with, with in- increasingly mothers working, that village of stay-at-home mothers is also like in, in, has experienced a massive shrinkage. So, I mean, yeah, I talk to people here in Charlottesville who say, I know we are we are not going to have children because we just do not have the support around us to be able to do it. Um, so I think, I think it is a significant factor, this demise of the village around people um, and is why the wider picture of social capital is, is so important. I do think like the education system is important for socialization, but that socialization does require secure attachment so some people i think extending public education downwards uh, from prior to pre-k is a huge mistake because i think actually will only work to further cripple the village if there's going to be federal investment in anything prior to kindergarten then it needs to pre-k is going to need to uh, be about investing in the village around around parents. So that that might be about paid family leave. That might be about if you're going to pump money into um, the education system, let's see that as a school choice option. So um, one of the policies I think I'm most excited about is this idea of family hubs, um, and which is um, which we can get into in a minute. But I think it's definitely about pumping money into those things so that. Uh, you know, if if grandma is around to be able to help them, that's amazing. If that's kind of like an issue f- for her because of um, for of income, well, why don't they get those federal tax dollars, uh, those federal dollars for that they were going to pump into some universal pre K, and instead give it as a voucher or cash to the, to the wider network of carers, or do that through nonprofits or churches or anything where relationship and trust at a local level is being built. Mm-hmm. And so with respect to family hubs, this is something I, I really found fascinating in your paper because one of my concerns about the way paid family leave can potentially play out, um, obvi- obviously um, uh, people going back to work a week or two weeks or three weeks after they've had a baby seems maybe barbaric. On the other hand, Paid family leave in the context of highly isolated parenting might be marginally better, but that's still leaving a gigantic gap. Um, and so what I, I, I'm interested to hear more about what your thoughts are on these family hubs, because if you're giving people the, the, the time to build this relationship with their baby, but they lack the internal resources and the external support to actually do that, um, we we may not get the the benefit from that that we're that we're doing it for in the first place, right? And but if you add family hubs in that are done such that they are actually valuable, trusted resources for people who are feeling isolated, whether that's you know a, a upper middle income suburban parent or um, a, a, an inner city young woman who who's on her own um it, it would seem as though different versions of a quote family hub which i'm sure existed in other forms and other names throughout human history right mm. so what what are your thoughts on that yeah well I, there's, there's so much wrapped up in this too and um i think we because we're sort of talking a little bit about okay well if attachment is the ideal and we're like really far from that you know how how do we progress to a situation where there is sort of like greater attachment and then for those um for those who themselves do not have the the, the resources with them because there wasn't secure attachment there wasn't a nurturing approach as they were sort of like um growing up because actually they're they they're still struggling with their complex trauma from their own upbringing you know what is it that is is needed there if daycare is like such an integral part of how people are able to sort of make ends meet um what bridging is required to be able to go from there to sort of like some sort of slightly more ideal scenario 
And I think family hubs is possibly, you know, as a sol- possible solution sort of that factors in all of those things. The, the concept of family hubs that sort of uh, we're, we're talking about here is, as you say, it's it could could benefit people from all backgrounds, but I think it's, it's definitely for those who are experiencing low social capital to begin with. But I think there are tons of hundreds of, uh, for example, say church buildings that might be empty during the week um, or not used um, that are could be used as daycare facilities um, if, if needs be. But if we're wanting to sort of help build relationship, ch- churches or any other nonprofit who've got like space could run daycare facilities, but family hubs are there to provide um signposting to or provision of non-profits who are able to provide wraparound care. So they might be able to provide parenting coaching. Uh, they might be able to provide relationship crisis counseling, um, work, work on codependence, work on how to how to avoid abusive relationships, um, budgeting classes, cooking classes, how to make a meal, you know, things that might be obvious to, to lots of people, but they are rocket science to, to anyone that's not seen it, a role model to them. And so family hubs are, are are there to provide, could be there to provide those sorts of wraparound services, but most critically to then build relationships. So for example, I was chatting to one group in Texas who are developing uh, these sorts of centers. And what they're aiming to be able to do is to provide daycare for uh, those who are on low income. But the critical aspect of it is not only is it a safe daycare facility but see i think in this case they're talking to a church that they want the uh, members of the church to be able to provide lifts for the mums uh, to and from their work in the daycare center to build relationship with that mother um, so that they have got other resources to hand um, and that's the sort of thing that i think we're wanting that's a sort of a bridging type approach where um people are you know, in these in these buildings, in these centres, you know, um, you know, social services can be there if needs be. The foster care, you know, people can be there if, if that's um, helpful. They can be the bad cop, um, but the point is that then the non profit people are there as as the good cop, um, and I think that sort of that sort of programming is like really essential. There was, for example, if I may speak anecdotally, when I was in England, I visited a a charity that did amazing work um, in this area. How they did it was that they would work in, um, it was an Oxford-based charity, and they would work with a primary school. That, that, that's not what we call them here, is it? Um, what do you call them here? <laughs> Those first elementary, years? Uh, elementary yes, school. Elementary, yes, elementary, elementary, school. elementary school. do what's okay, in. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So uh, elementary school, they would go into an elementary school um, and they would take a nurturing approach um, to to the raising of children. And it was a fascinating project because what they did was they would take the entire staff of the school from janitorial through to admin, um, through to the teaching staff, through a nurturing program. Um, the school I visited was a um, Muslim majority school, both the staff and the um, pupils, the students. And I remember telling to one of the teachers and she said, this was an amazing program for me because I realized I hadn't been nurtured in my own childhood. So this program has equipped me to be able to nurture myself. And then I, I, I'm approaching my teaching in a completely different way as a result. Um, anyway, what they would then do, they saw that the, this charity would then see in, in those schools, bullying go down, violence go down, educational attainment would go up um, as, as, as they sort of like equip staff and, um, and, and students around a nurturing approach. What was fascinating too was that they did outreach to parents. And so um, the parents would come in and they'd be like, I have seen my child completely change. What is going on here? I, I want to learn this too. So that sort of improved wow. the quality of, of the, the home situation. And I mentioned it because what was interesting, I was, I was chatting to a mother who was there at the, uh, who had attended the project. Her social worker had said, if we will take your children away from you unless you go to this program um, and uh, and do its materials. So she very reluctantly went along to this part of West London to join in on this program. And she said to me, I just realized halfway through the program, I just had this aha moment where I realized I was parenting the way I had been parented and I could make a choice about how to do it differently. Mm. And that is like completely golden. And it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> the social worker could like try and say that, but it's going to a voluntary group 
And then in that space, they act as the good cop. Um, and then you kind of like see something different. And that's what needs to be replicated. And so I think in a family hub, it's about wanting to be able to provide that sort of context and opportunity. But I think working together like that, I think, is a potential for benefit there in, in a family hub situation. I think family hubs should be as well known a name as, I don't know, McDonald's. Right. You know, yeah. it's just something, it should be a household name, but a family hub should just be totally generic, really safe. People know that this is where they can go to uh, for some good advice and to meet some quality people. I think it's a bridging mechanism for... I mean, because people will say, okay, for people who are in distress situations, the evidence does show that you can put your baby into a childcare, daycare centre facility, and they may have better educational results than if they're simply stuck at home in a sort of abusive, drug-ridden context. But that's a very short-term measure. What we want to be able to do is invest in those families that don't know necessarily how to do parenting, don't know necessarily how to sort of grow social capital. They are the ones who need not just money, but just absolutely shoveled in as much care as can be provided. Um, and so that's why one of the things that we've recommended in the paper is there must be a priority given to, if people are motivated by faith to care for other people, then that needs to be factored in. We don't want to exclude people who are motivated by their faith, whatever their faith may be, to um, help other people in their, in their, in their society. If they, if they get supported by some federal money, then that is perfectly legitimate if they are providing some sort of basic social care to those people. If that mother, for example, in this context, or if that abusive dad has some sort of aha moment and sort of like changes his ways and they start going to church or they're now going to synagogue, um, they, they should not have their money suspended for that. We should be absolutely celebrating the building of social capital by people who are, who are going to go to these groups and build relationships outside of those, um, outside of I know, the criminal justice system, social workers and the police. Yes. Yeah, it's just a, it's a tremendous uh, resource yeah. that we need to be tapping. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It's what we need. Yes. Um, so here's a question that I have, and I don't know if, if you've, this, the focus on the early years, the attachment is something you've taken up fairly recently. So I don't know how much you've kind of gotten into, um, some of this. Um, I wrote a piece recently that American Compass, um, published called Raising Young Children at Home, in which I argued, um, I sort of alluded to attachment theory, but argued that um, there's considerable research that suggests that for many young children, their own home is what one might describe as the quote, optimal learning environment. Um, thing one, it's just for many children, it's going to be what's best for them um, developmentally. And number two, it's what many parents want. The distinction I've been drawing however, has been between uh, parental care and what I describe as non-parental group care. And to me, that is the, the, that, that's, that's what I'm most concerned about, is the difference between a nine-month-old spending the days, their, their days at home with a loved, trusted person in a small scale environment, familiar environment, versus spending their days in a group of best case scenario, uh, very best case scenario, five ba other babies, probably seven other babies, and then up from there with paid strangers. Um, so one of the, the one of the questions, you know, uh, in terms of a, the history of attachment theory, the, most of the research, for obvious reasons, has been done on on mothers. Um, Patrick Brown uh, wrote a piece, just uh, published a piece just a few uh, weeks ago, um, titled "Moving Past the Mommy Wars," in which he argued that sort of I think along the lines of what I'm suggesting that the key issue is enabling close attached family ties, parental care, but that if that is uh, the father rather than the mother, for all intents and purposes, that's, that's sort of a, a, a win. So he cites research, uh, really interesting research, which you probably have seen that um, a, a, a sociologist named uh, Catherine Hakim 
um, her research has found that 20% of women she describes as work-centered women. Like that's just what they're focused on. 20% are home-centered women who do little paid work after marriage, or at least while their, their children are young. 60% she describes as ambivalent women who seek to combine paid work with childbearing and child re- rearing. In some cases, I think sequential, a woman who's home for three years and then goes back to work full or part-time. But in an effort to promote attachment, given the choice between kind of amping up pressure on mothers to fill this role, leading in some cases to mothers who don't want to be doing it are not don't, don't are not nurturing. They themselves may not have been adequately nurtured, but they might be married to a guy who is in fact very nurturing and wants to play this role. Putting myself in the shoes of a baby, I think I would ranking my options. I think <laughs> maybe as a baby, you know, you were inside this woman this whole time. So just continuing that on seamlessly, maybe that's from a baby's point of view, like the, the most obvious, right? But being then all day, every day with a, a person who's ambivalent about being there with me as a baby, I think would be worse for me than being there all day, every day with my father or let's just say even a grandmother who is thrilled to be, or mostly thrilled to be there with me. And either one of those choices would be so preferable to me as a baby than being bundled up in my 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 little snowsuit or whatever with my big pink backpack and being dropped off at a building where I spend all day every day, not even in a mixed gray age group of, of, of children, all day every day with a bunch of other babies sitting in my little car seat. Um, so that's all just a long preamble to ask your thoughts on the relative pros and cons of focusing on women in this role, mothers in this role, focusing on maternal care as opposed to say parental care. Yeah, I think I think the, this is uh, these are really obviously great questions and then and this whole conversation obviously I should start with a caveat these are such personal issues that we're talking about and will be you know triggering to anyone because this is I mean these are very intimate private decisions they, they you know that the impact who we are and issue from who we are so none none of this is talked about lightly but I think stepping back from that caveat is just trying to look at what some of the evidence suggests um I mean I think you're right Janet Erickson um, written uh, for the Institute for Family Studies, where she's unearthed some uh, s- studies that do show, uh, which we reflected in, in the early years report, that a uh, l- long number of hours of non-maternal care... Um, or or non- non-parental. Yeah, uh, yeah, That's like, what it I, actually showed, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll get on to primary caregivers in a second. Um, right, right, but right. yeah, But I think, I think it was sort of daycare, that it does... It does have long-term impact. Um, now, obviously, for the the family who feels like they have no choice but to to, to go to daycare, struggling to make ends meet, this is hardly good news. Being told you're you're, you're screwing up your kid by sticking them into daycare for forty hours plus a week. Um, I, mean, I, I do, th- I'm, and then they will say, "Oh, but the kid is getting socialized." And I just think that you know, a six-month-old is not getting socialized by being in in, in a sort of like daycare center with tons of others of, of the same age. You know, so I think Erica Commissar writes really well about this um, in her book, Being There. Um, and she, uh, you know, talks there about um, primary caregivers. So that the, if, what's the gold standard or o- optimal situation would be, yes, you've got a nurturing, attuned mother who is available to, to their uh, child. Um, the, the, the next best thing is an alternative primary caregiver. So as you're saying, that could be um, the dad or, you know, if you're lucky enough, wealthy enough, that could be the nanny who sticks around for long enough <laughs> but, you know, without quitting. Or, you know, it could be a grandparent. But the idea is that that, that it isn't without complication for the baby. It's some sort of like primal level of grief to sort of transition to that. Um, but, the, but the alternative um, surrogate, 
pr- primary care from from someone else than the family or uh, um, someone who is paid is certainly better. Uh, the least optimal option is, as you were saying, daycare with a rapid rotation of uh, an 18 to 20 year olds who are sometimes there and sometimes not there. And that would be the case for, um, you know, if you have a two dad situation or something like that, um, you know, or, or any other sort of like surrogacy type situation. There is, again, it's not without complication for the child um, to to be re- removed in that sense from having primary care from their mother. Um, and then, yes, lots of attachment theory people will talk about, you know, a mother who is on antidepressants um, for her postpartum depression, you know, is who is not emotionally available, that that has a negative impact on the child. So that, that you know, it's all of this is about real life. Um, but I think it's just sort of looking at the and it's also massively complicated to think about this from a cultural and economic or a policy perspective. But there's a sense in which, um, you know, and I'm, we're trying to sort of hash out some work of what, what does early years look like? Um, how, how can we promote attachment theory? And there is a sense in which they, there is a very simple truth here. Um, and it is about sort of being able to communicate that truth about sort of like bonding w- with mother. I don't know where that fits into sort of um, Patrick Brown's excellent article on on the mummy wars uh, from the early noughties and, and now. But I think we do want to be able to promote it. I, I'm a firm believer in supporting people's personal aspirations. Mm-hmm. Um, so this isn't about um, creating policy that, where, where people are sort of put under duress, but it's about getting behind people and what it is that they want to do. Some of that, though, is definitely about making sure that people are able to have informed and uh, make informed decisions. So I think we should be promoting attachment theory, um, which has been I mean, attachment, Mary Ainsworth did her studies in Uganda. There have been studies done across Latin America. There are some people who say that, you know, attachment theory is just, sort of, that they think it's sort of like some weird boomer concocted reality that only fits the nuclear family as established in the United States. But actually, the research is cross-cultural, has been done across decades. And this is actually a lot more about sort of like mammalian biology and evolution than it is in, that it is any sort of social construct. Um, you know, the social constructs that, if anything, run the other way. So I think we do want to, we want to make sure that attachment theory is promoted as a reality in um, prenatal classes. Um, I was going to say antenatal classes, but I think here we talk about prenatal classes, just so that people can make an informed decision. It's like, well, if people want to make, you know, if, if there are people who want to go through this period of economic deprivation to be able to sort of like invest in this like not to three year period, then let, let's, let, let's let them do that. I also think it would be great to have a public campaign around attachment theory in the same way that we've done campaigns around the environment and smoking um, and, uh, you know, teen pregnancy. Because it, these mass campaigns do have a way of shifting an informed market. So if investors, if employers, if employees can see the value of secure attachment, then we would want, therefore, voluntarily for individuals to decide, well, I'm going to work for this company, not that company. If, for example, I wanted to be able to go to a fast food restaurant, I might not do it if I knew that their staff weren't going to be treated very well. Um, I'd want to make sure that, you know, the janitorial staff uh, have have proper um, you know, job security. So if they're going to, so I think we want to make sure that the environment is one where the market is informed and the market is able to put a premium on secure attachment. And I think long term that that's necessary anyway. You know, people are very concerned about automation and AI and that sort of thing and having their jobs taken away from them. This totally puts a premium on emotional intelligence. Um, and the things that are going to make people distinctive in the marketplace are being able to, um, you know, know themselves and to have a sense of empathy um, and understanding of how people work. If you're, if you don't have empathy, that that thing developed in the prefrontal cortex in those first three years, um, then you uh, and there's a rise in narcissism. You are not going to. You're going to be fantastic on Instagram. Um, but you are not going to, you, you may not be able to sort of like manage complex human relationships, which an AI thing is not going to be able to do. Similarly, the premium, I think they should put a premium on nursing and teaching and anything that involves um, sort of like individual care. Yes, yes. So, all right, well, we, this, I could 
go on talking for hours. Um, I thank you so much for giving us so much of your time. I have two <laughs> kind of personal questions that I wanted to end with. Um, and I'm hoping that you can come back after this, this is all underway to kind of talk about how it's playing out because I'm just so excited about your take on this and your, the folk, the, the attention you're bringing to this or getting ready to bring to this. Um, so the first question I have is what are you, what do, in sort of the, both in the general social capital campaign um, context in general, I guess, but in this country in particular, um, and the, and the, and including the early years focus, what are you, what do you find most frustrating? What, what is most just not adding up for you? I think the, the, um, the funding environment around, around this is a little bit frustrating. I think, um, I wrote a paper on civil society about the sort of like arms race of, of billionaire philanthropy that is like pumping money into influencing federal policy, um, and none of it seems to necessarily sort of like take this into account. I think on the right, there's a lot of libertarian money that just sort of wants to pretend the family doesn't exist. Um, that, that we're just sort of economic units or something. I don't know. Um, and so they seem to ignore all of this, thinking it's a bit unpalatable. And then I think on the left, the money is so captured with sort of exciting thoughts about alternative social constructs that it also similarly bypasses this or finds it offensive. Um, I mean, this stuff around attachment and sort of like putting a premium on sort of like biological mothers is so offensive to so many across the spectrum, um, which is bizarre, really, given it's just a sort of a fact of life, um, that I think that to me is the most frustrating thing. It's like wherever I turn, people are upset. So I think, I but to me, that's just a, a marker of like where, um, why this is so necessary. It's just so basic. It's so, so basic and so, actually so inoffensive and such a celebration of, of, of who women are and what, what, what life's about that, um, that I think, you know, let's just, we, do, we just shouldn't need to shy away from, from these sorts of things and we can sort of be honest about it. But I think the polarized funding um, uh, machine is, is, is slightly confusing to me. Yes. Um, and then the last question I have is, what in your own life, whether when you were an infant or any any time since then, has led you to care so much about these the work you've done in the UK and here? They're quite similar. What leads you to care about this? Yeah, I think I think that is probably like something of a personal journey. So I think my own father um, grew up in poverty. He he was a window cleaner um, during the Margaret Thatcher years. And he managed, I think, to possibly become a millionaire off, off the back of his own industry. Um, and uh, he, he built a national um, sort of contract cleaning company providing janitorial services, sort of employing 2,000 people. And so me growing up, I think uh, I was aware that his his childhood had been very different to mine, but, you know, I had a lot of... Um, financial provision and that sort of thing went to private school for sort of from very early on. But I was aware of the lack of emotional nurture in our own home because I think both my parents experienced their own lack of nurture themselves. I think I, I then, um, I, I think it's through attendance at church and seeing other families and other relationships. Um, and then through some sort of my own experience of therapy, I sort of like began to realize some of the importance um, of self-care. And I also worked at a hostel for homeless people for two years um, after I graduated at high school and so could see the, the, the sort of catastrophe writ large into sort of like 20 people just because of their own family background situations. So I volunteered for two years at a hostel for homeless people working with alcoholics and addicts and ex-foster care leavers and that sort of thing. And uh, it was pretty <laughs> pretty grim and intense two years and i think i wish i'd rather done a gap year learning spanish in in madrid but um but it was uh wow. it was very eye-opening um and that's why it was very interesting to then work for this think tank in london because it, this was not an isolated case the the project i worked in every town every city that i visited in england had had some sort of project like it where they were working with this um working with people who just had just multiple areas of collapse in their life um and the the nonprofit working with them just helped them to have like a brief moment of like oh gosh this is why I mean, so you would see some success i mean where i worked at it, it was 
I'm not, I'm not sure how much success there was. We were just able to provide sort of basic care. But I think, I think it's that. So those are sort of extreme ends, but they, it was a, it was a focus on, it was an eye opening to see what a lack of social capital, a lack of nurture, a lack of solidity in family, all of that sort of thing has on those people in areas of multiple deprivation. So I think it's that that motivates me. I think, and then more recently, you know, we have our, we have our three year old, and so we experience our own lack, lack of village here in Charlottesville, which is a, a wonderful city. But I think, you know, we are we are aware of of just the hardship of uh, of raising uh, children um, with a lack of resources. So um, I guess one last question: the social capital campaign launched fairly recently, right? Mm. Looking forward, what are you most excited about being able to bring to the United States through this? Yeah, well, I mean, so uh, whilst I hope to become an American very soon, uh, this is definitely work that has been concocted and devised by um, Americans and DC scholars and think tankers um, who, you know, have long a lot of experience in this. I mean, my hope is that we were able to put forward a pretty modest set of sensible policies um, that would appeal if they were like writ large as promoted, they would appeal to the electorate. You know, basically, they'd be like, yes, this would be fantastic. This would allow me to uh, to do family. This would make sure I've got great education. This would be make sure that you know we've got a job. This would allow people to aspire to the American dream. So I think that my hope would be that we put forward a modest set of uncontroversial policies that um, enacted would allow people to build on their social capital rather than squander it uh, or, or have to sacrifice it either for the big man uh, making lots of money um, or or to appease um, uh, you know a variety of agendas so I think that would be the, the hope the social capital campaign is in itself is as a campaign sort of um, you know short term I think long term we uh, we do hope to I hope to be able to do some work on the early years um, I think it seems it's come up again and again and again across the papers that we've looked at. And there's such a, there's such room for growth in this area um, that, and I would love to be able to work with anyone that's listening in who has an interest, has an objection. You know, this is a massive conversation to be had, and it would lo- be amazing to be able to partner with you, Catherine, um, and the centre there, and to be able to partner with anyone listening in on being able to make sure that this conversation, which is so important, um, you know, you know, it is had. That would be the hope. More conversation and getting things done. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, Chris, this has been been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for spending so much time. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. That's great. Thank you so much, Catherine. A pleasure to be with you here. Thanks so much to Chris for this terrific conversation. And thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Check out our work at ccfp.org and follow us on Twitter at underscore ccfp and at KB Stevens. We'll see you on the next episode of Early Matters. You've been listening to Early Matters, the podcast on the science and policy of early childhood, produced by the Center on Child and Family Policy. 